This talk will be given by Professor Yavuz Kurse, who is Professor of Turkish Studies in the Institute for Oriental Studies at the University of Vienna. Professor Kurse's research focuses on social, economic and consumer history of the Ottoman Empire and Turkey. He has published extensively on Nestle and on other aspects of consumer history of the late empire, including articles on department stores, chocolate, and the first Ottoman trademark regulation. He is co-editor of Seeds of Power, Explorations of Ottoman Environmental History, published in 2019. His talk today is on the Armeno Turkish manuscripts and prints in the Mek Mekitaris congregation in Vienna as a unique source for the intellectual and cultural history of the Ottoman Empire. I now hand over to Professor Kurse. Thank you, thank you, Kate. So I feel quite honored to be the last in your lecture series and welcome uh, to everyone and the audience. Uh, I'm not sure if you can already see my shared, uh, the presentation, you can. So it's okay, so wonderful. Then I just start. Um, as you know, uh, Vienna is uh, full of places, sites, objects that illustrate the complex and entangled history of the Ottoman Empire that goes back to the 16th century and which up to the present plays an important role in the uh, so-called Erinnerungskultur, remembrance culture of the Austrians and the Viennese. Without doubt, the successful defense against the second siege of Vienna in 1683 occupies a very special position. Today, the city is also home to many people who after the recruitment, recruitment treaty uh, between Turkey and Austria was signed in 1964, came as migrants from Turkey. Besides Turks, Kurds, uh, Armenians also came. They do have multi-layered and changing relationship with the cultural heritage of the city. Uh, that is informed by different experiences and references. Further, Vienna is popular destination, a popular destination for tourists from all over the world, and of course from Turkey, whose engagement with the city's Ottoman Turkish heritage may differ considerably. Thus, for each group, which are not necessarily entirely homogeneous, the rich Ottoman cultural heritage of Vienna has different, sometimes entangled shared, often opposed meanings that change over time. Moreover, important aspects of this heritage, namely its Armenian, Greek, or Jewish dimensions have often been ignored until recently, and many of the references to the Ottoman past are labeled Turk. Klaus Kreiser reminds us that uh, the equation of Turk with Ottomans or Turkey with the Ottoman Empire while not entirely appropriate, is sanctioned by centuries of Western and Eastern usage. So in a certain way, also sales promoting one couldn't add. Uh, using Turk uh, is uh, really um, um, ensuring that um, books probably may be more, um, uh, let's say, uh, better for advertising. As a rule, let's say, works focuses on the Turkish, uh, the city's Turkish heritage, as can be seen from the titles of some of popular works I will just show you shortly here. Um, even if these works provide rich and detailed material concerning the Ottoman Habsburg encounters and Vienna's Ottoman traces, they do so exclusively by stressing the Turkish perspective. The project, as you can see here, uh, called Türken Gedächtnis, on the other hand, explores within the context of the second siege of Vienna, the processes surrounding the erection of those monuments that commemorate the Turks, uh, that is Ottomans, but also how they were used, when, by whom, and how. As interesting as such approaches are, and as common as the term Turk was used for a variety of ethno-religious groups, they run the risk of reinforcing the stereotypes they address. In any case, they narrow the perspective by focusing almost uh, exclusively on Turks, this is, that is Ottoman Muslims. But there are exceptions. Even though the title, the Türken in Wien, the Turks in Wien, imply that again, Turks are at the center, 
The exhibition catalog edited by Felicitas Heimann Jelinek in 2010 present the fascinating, sorry, fascinating exhibition uh, uh, history of the Sephardic community in Vienna. In recent years, the number of works uh, dedicated to the Warais Ottoman groups and their role in Vienna has increased. Authors such as David uh, De Passo or Anna Ransmeyer have shown that even after the withdrawal of the Ottoman Empire from Central Europe after 1683, Ottomans, that this Armenians, Greeks, and Jews were part of the city's socioeconomic and urban fabric and that cross-cultural circulations between the Ottoman and Habsburg empires have existed and went on. Karl Tetley drew attention to Vienna's Armenian colony already in the 1970s. From the end of the 17th century, Vienna became an important center for Armenians. According to Tetley, most Armenians were Catholics in 1678, Vada Pest Narsis from Yerevan, for instance, was titular court chaplain, and in 1701, also canon of the St. Stephan's Cathedral. Many Armenians worked as interpreters or traders, but were also recruited by the Habsburg court war council as informants and spies. Members of other professions, such as doctors, craftsmen, and clergymen, um, usually also engaged in trade. The oldest coffee merchants in Vienna were also Armenians, and certainly Isaac De Luca and Johannes Diadato being the most famous ones. Johannes Diadato was born in Constantinople in 1640. After settling in Vienna in the around 1660s, he received the permission from the Viennese uh, court in 1685 to prepare Türkische Getränke als Kaffee, Tee uh, und Sherbet, as that means coffee, tea, and sorbet, or Sherbet as we know it. And he opened his first Viennese coffee house in the same year, that is 1685. The Armenian and Greek traders were apparently so successful that in the second half of the 17th century, the complaints of Viennese merchants about growing competition increased. Um, and in fact, uh, there are toll lists from 1663 uh, to 1688 indicating or share about 65 to 75 percent of uh, these uh, foreign merchants. In 1767, 21 male Armenians are registered in a conscription in addition to 82 Greeks. Today, I would like to draw your attention to one of the most, uh, I think, uh, most fascinating Armenian institutions that can be considered as a site of an entangled cultural heritage uh, in many ways. The Mehitaris Congregation in Vienna, established in 1811, is a place where the history of Armenians, the Habsburg, and the Ottoman empires can be traced not only by the monastery complex, uh, and the church, as you can see, but above all, through the invaluable collection of more than 2,600 Armenian manuscripts and more than 150,000 books that it holds. The basis uh, of this rich collection was led by Mehita of Sebaste, um, who was born in Sivas uh, uh, in 1676. He found, sorry, this is the library, uh, which uh, you can just see. I will just hear. Um, this is uh, Mehita of Sebaste, born 1676 in Sivas. He founded the congregation on 8 September 1701 in Constantinople, shortly after he and his fellows left the Ottoman Empire to escape persecution, most probably due to confessional disputes, and founded a monastery in Methony at the southwestern point of the Peloponnese, which by then was part of the Republic of Venice. Already at that time, they adopted the Benedictine rule of, uh, and Pope Clement XI confirmed them officially as Benedictines. Since then, the Mehitorists are also properly called Armenian Benedictines. 
after Methony fell to the Ottomans and the destruction of the monastery and the church, he had his uh, order settled in Venice around 1715. In, 19, in 1770, they were granted the island of San Lazaro near by Venice, uh, by the Republic of Venice, where they built their monastery, which is a property of the congregation to this day. Mejita Sebasti worked here, there as head of the order, writer, publicist, publicist and uh, until his death in 1749. In 1727, he published a grammar of modern Armenian, which is considered the oldest publication in Ottoman Turkish printed in Armenian script. So sorry for the quality, I've just um, uh, copied it from uh, another book, uh, but uh, you know, hopefully you get a, a good impression. Due to a conflict, uh, a Few, a few members of the order left the mother house in Venice and settled in Trieste in 1773. Empress Maria Theresia integrated the monks, uh, who from then on called themselves Mechitalists, into her policy towards the Orient, granting them the right to settle in the Habsburg Empire in 1775. And here you can see the uh, permission to settle uh, in the Habsburg Empire. The Mechitris received a convent, a church, and a school. The congregation was allowed to accept priests, novices, clerics, and lay brothers, run missions, and open branches within the Habsburg Empire, and as well as in the Middle East, uh, Middle and Near East. And most importantly, they were granted the right to run a printing office with Armenian and Latin letters, which has been started already uh, in Trieste. After Trieste fell to France in uh, 1809, Francis, uh, first the founder of the uh, Austrian Empire, the Kaiser from Österreich, granted them asylum in Vienna in 1810 and confirmed their former privileges. Already in 1810, a new printing house was opened within the new building, the former Kapuziner Kloster uh, Am Platzl, which was destroyed uh, in 1683 by the Ottomans and rebuilt again in 1684 after the successful defense of the siege. And you can see here uh, not the original building. Uh, this is uh, the uh, plan for the monastery uh, uh, in the 19th century. And the right or the left picture you can see is the Alte Kapuziner closest, the old one. And uh, the new plan is from uh, the 1930s. The Mikhitris fathers yeah, contributed to what uh, was called uh, the 19th century Armenian Renaissance or Armenian Awakening by engaging in a variety of fields such as publication of Armenian classical texts, purifying and working on the classical Armenian language, research and study of Armenian history, translations from and into Armenian education and the network of Mechitarist Mech schools and Probably you know that uh, uh, until today, there is one uh, school in Istanbul still, uh, which was uh, founded in 1825. You see the picture, the Pangalta Mikhitaryan uh, school, which is called today the private Armenian school of uh, Pangalta. Vienna became a center for scientific research and especially in the philological, uh, philological disciplines. Um, the basis for this kind of research was provided by the Mechitarist Library the, that accumulated um, a substantial number of ancient manuscripts and modern printed books. In addition, there is the world's largest collection of Armenian newspapers and periodicals. Just to mention, I've just talked to uh, the librarian. He told me that the Gulbekian Foundation is now at the moment um, funding a, a digitalization project, which is up to 500,000 pages of these Armenian uh, newspapers, which will be digitized. And then uh, interestingly not uh, provided to the 
audience from Vienna, but from everyone. So uh, the server will be um, uh, not uh, here, uh, but it's an project, ongoing project with, which will last, I think, uh, around uh, two to three years until being finished. Vienna became, um, uh, uh, so sorry, uh, among the rich collection of the Mechitorist Library, which you can see here, there's a considerable number of manuscripts and prints, including one of the most comprehensive collection of newspapers in Turkish written in Armenian script. So this is basically the topic of today's talk. Um, the Turkish written in Armenian script may also be called, uh, uh, among others, Dutch Keren. Already at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Friedrich Krelitz from Greif, uh, Greifenhorst dealt with Armeno Turkish. Um, from the linguistic point of view, here you see uh, Krelitz Greifenhorst, and this is the uh, very first publication on Armeno Turkish. Um, and um, Hakan Karateke has uh, been um, translating this, uh, public, uh, this publication of uh, Krelitz Greifenhorst, which has been published already in 1996 by Kibikic in the volume number four. Starting in 1915-16, Friedrich von Krelitz Greifenhorst taught at the Department of Near Eastern Studies uh, at our institute today, becoming the first full professor of Turkish around in the winter term 1923 and 24, a position he held until 19. 32. One of the fields of uh, Krelitz Greifenhorst's work was Turkish philology, but he was specialized in Turku Tatar and Armenian language. But later he is, became actually most more famous for his uh, work on an edition of uh, Ottoman documents in particular. He may be considered the founder of what we call uh, diplomatic or Ottoman Turkish diplomatics, a focus that still occupies an important position in Vienna today. So probably you know all uh, that uh, uh, my colleagues Claudia Römer, Gisela Prohaska, Eisel uh, went on uh, to work on uh, Ottoman diplomatics as uh, a variety of publication uh, in that field, and uh, his opus magnum, one might say, is the publication of the Osmanische Urkunden in Turkish Sprache. Uh, that means the documents from the second half of the 15th century. Probably it should not, it's not the topic, but I think it's uh, uh, important to mention that uh, uh, Krelitz Grafenhorst, uh, as uh, uh, important as his important uh, contributions to the Ottoman studies were, were he, he was a part of a well-organized anti-Semitic network at the University of Vienna in the interwar period that drove Jewish and leftist researchers out of the university, uh, which is basically um, um, not a common history, but it, it should be noted that within the Orientalistic, uh, within the German speaking uh, areas, we do have several examples in that uh, kind. But uh, uh, as you see, um, he was uh, quite early on within this network. Another 70 years were to pass before another Viennese professor of Turkish studies again conducted studies on Armino Turkish. Already in 1964, Haik Berberian, in his article La Literature Armino Turk, pointed out, and I'm, I'm uh, just translating it from French. Uh, Armenian Turkish literature has so far been only partially studied from the linguistic point of view. The literary value of the works in question has not been the subject of special studies. In 1981, Andreas Tietze, together with Avedis Sanjian, edited and translated Eremia Celebi Konijan's Armino Turkish poem, The Jewish Bride, from the 17th century. Yet Andrea Tietze's edition of the first Turkish novel, um, Akabi Hikayesi, which was written in Armenian Turkish, can be considered the most important contribution to the Ottoman literary history. The novel was translated into Armenian already in 1953 by Karnik Stepanyan and printed in Erevan in 2018, just where recently 
uh, Dar uh, Harutiounian published a French translation of the novel uh, with a foreword by Johann Strauss. And uh, I can just recommend this book, uh, which is not just only the translation, it has a huge annex uh, of documents and illustrations. And um, probably you may just write uh, the author, the translator to get a, a, a copy uh, because I, I wouldn't, I couldn't find it uh, uh, or couldn't buy it. I just wrote him an email. If you like, I can share with you later. Um, Tietz's translation uh, for the first time appreciated the seminal contribution of Armenian intellectuals on literary uh, and literary to the development of Turkish literature. This publication initiated further research on Turkish literature that included the contributions of millet communities or so-called millet communities of the Ottoman Empire, such as Armenians, Greeks, and Jews. Authors like Johann Strauss, Evangelia Balta, Edith Andros, Garo Abrahamian, Dorte Sagasta, Laurent Mignon, or Murat Chankara, Petros Delmatosian, uh, and not to forget Sebuch, uh, Sebuch Aslanian, um, have made uh, important contributions here. One of the most important contributions in this context, uh, I would say, is certainly the volume uh, as it, that you can see here between religion and language, Turkish speaking, Christian Jews and Greek speaking Muslims and Catholics in the Ottoman Empire, which was edited in 2000, no, uh, sorry, to, uh, not to, uh, 2011, yes, um, uh, by Evan Evangelia Balta and Mehmet Elmers, um, which include articles on a variety of literatures such as Syro-Turkic, Kyrillic Turkish, Hebrew Turkish, Karamandika, and of course, Armino Turkish literature. What all these studies remind us perpetually is the fact that to this day, a comprehensive inventory of these literatures is missing, probably within the context uh, of uh, these studies, we may have uh, today one exception, uh, uh, um, the case of the Karaman Lidika, uh, since Evangelia Balta has really um, provided uh, um, uh, really valuable uh, publications uh, for the Karaman Lidika collections. Um, but it is especially true, this uh, kind of um, missing link, uh, uh, so to say, is uh, especially true for the Armenian Turkish collection of the Mechitaris congregation in Vienna. True, uh, there is a seminal bibliography of Armenian Turkish prints and press of Hasnik Stepanian, which is based on Garnik Stepanian's unedited bibliography of almost 1,000 titles. And according to Hasmik Stepanian's bibliography, we do have around 2,000 Armenian Turkish titles and more than 100 newspapers and journals. Johann Strauss and Murat Janka, among others, have already pointed to some shortcomings of Stepanian's bibliography. One of the main problems is that the listed titles cannot always be clearly assigned to a specific location. And um, according to Haik Berberian, Ghanik Stepanian has identified more than 700 Armenian Turkish titles in the Viennese collection. So if you go to the uh, collection, uh, to the bibliography of Hasmik Stepanian, you will find these titles, but not necessarily with assigned location in Vienna. So it's really hard to find out where these titles are located. And um, So I just uh, uh, coming to the collection of the uh, Armenian uh, Turkish collection of the Mehitas collection, I would like to uh, thank or take the opportunity first to thank Archbishop Levon Zekian for allowing us uh, uh, to view and work with this incredible collection. And many thanks also go to Father Simon, the librarian I have mentioned before, who is uh, not only the librarian, he's the archivist of the congregation. So without their support and help, this preliminary study would ha not have been possible. Above all, I would also like to thank my colleagues, Julia Cilic uh, and uh, uh, from the Ruhr University Bochum and Anisa Aksian from the University of Hamburg, 
who were sifting through the collection with me and providing valuable guidance. So we spent actually several days in the library examining through and photographing all Armenian Turkish manuscripts and prints we can we could uh, identify. Afterwards, all uh, titles were transferred into an Excel file in, uh, in the original Armenian script and in uh, transcription. I'm actually um, not sure if I can just quickly show you uh, how it looked like. So if you go to the Excel file sheet, it's like uh, a work in progress, but it was quite um, uh, uh, a challenge. So there's the or original, then the transcription. So we tried to fill uh, the missing links, which we uh, didn't get uh, from the bibliographies, and we are trying even now uh, to uh, to give some sort of an overview of the genres we can uh, could detect. I will just show you in a short and short uh, uh, what kind of genres or topics we could uh, figure out. So so far we have, I guess, I I'm not sure, a, more than 870 titles uh, identified. So just skipping back to the presentation. So. A preliminary investigation of the collection of Armino Turkish manuscripts, I have just shown you the prints and the, and the Mechitoris congregation in Vienna has revealed at least 62 manuscripts from the late 17th up to the 19th century. Uh, one of these pictures you see is a, is a manuscript, apparently the Mujeb El Pentname uh, in Armenian script. Uh, and we could find out six. 62 manuscripts uh, and around 50 of these uh, manuscripts are either uh, in Armenian Turkish or Armenian Turkish and Armenian and 12 manuscripts are in Armenian Kipchak. Uh, that is another Turkish uh, language which is uh, uh, for the field of Armenian Turkish quite uh, um, um, a common a combination Armenian letters for Kipchak. The bigger part of the corpus consists of Armenian Turkish books, which I've shown you uh, just in the Excel file and stored in the congregation, which amounts uh, uh, pretty much to the 700 volumes um, printed between the late 18th century up to the 20th century. Uh, yet a random examination has revealed that the library most likely contains more Armenian Turkish manuscripts and books. Existing catalogs and bibliographical sources are unsystematic and incomplete, and often Armenian Turkish manuscripts are part within the Armenian collection. So it's not quite easy to detect and find them. Further, the library in Vienna houses the world's largest collection of Armenian and, uh, as I mentioned, Armenian Turkish newspapers and periodicals, uh, another corpus. Father Simon. The librarian recently drew our attention to another 170 printed books belonging to the Armenian Turkish corpus, uh, which were separated and part of the Armenian uh, uh, um, collection of the library. So far, we have been able to record the index cards of these additional books. Within, uh, with this, we have been able to identify, as I mentioned before, around 875 Armenian Turkish printed books. Probably there will be more. And if you just remember that Stepanian has identified uh, in total, let's say 1,600, 700, and additional 300 um, minor collections. So, that's a huge collection which we are faced here uh, with. And um, just, just one other um, uh, example of these Armino printed uh, prints. Despite um, the extensive holdings, there has been no detailed study to this collection to date. So the investigation so far, which we have been pursued, uh, is just uh, some sort of a preparation of a larger project, which I'm trying to explain why it is important to deal with this issue on, uh, on a longer time span or scale. Um, so if you allow me, just um, let me call this uh, venture, uh, just Mechita as a project name. So um, I will just show you 
um, uh, some uh, outcomes of the exile fights analysis, so just a very re uh, small minor um, 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 research and analysis, you see uh, the number of publications, uh, if you go back just one slide, it is clear that most uh, of the um, publications uh, which are stored here in Vienna are uh, uh, where by publishing houses in Istanbul, as you can see, uh, we have Venice, Vienna as the, the sites of the Mechitaris congregation, but we do have also interesting uh, places, uh, of course, uh, Izmir, uh, Beirut, Aleppo, uh, even Buenos Aires we could find, and Boston, uh, but also New York, Nicosia, Paris, and uh, of course, Trieste. And uh, just uh, to show you, we can, so far we could identify around, let's, easy to, not easy to read, uh, excuse me for that, but we have around 170 publishing houses different, so they would have to be checked more thoroughly, but um, they are, uh, there is the correlation of uh, publishing houses and the number of books they have publishing, and this is just a, uh, to give you an idea, um, and if you go to the topics, we have tried to now, at least uh, to get uh, to figure out what topics are uh, these uh, books about. So most of them, which is um, actually uh, um, what we know from other studies so far, most of the publications are religion uh, or have religious uh, topics and literary is the second. But we do have some interesting books, uh, such as for cooking, we have uh, identified for cooking. Um, uh, Yemek Kitapları in Armenian script, and uh, we do have uh, history books, of course, ph philosophy, music, uh, stylistic, and uh, quite uh, interesting uh, textbooks, school books. Uh, and this is just uh, um, to give you an idea um, of what we could so far figure out. So if you go to the number of books which has been uh, separated here through the decennies, let's say uh, uh, each 10 years, how many books were have been published or um, uh, that are stored here. You can see an, uh, that at the end of the 19th century, we have some sort of a peak, which is basically at the same time when the Mechitos Congregation and the printing house itself was really uh, um, very influential and uh, you see also clearly a sharp rise in the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, you see um, um, between 1910 and 1918, we have 35 publication, but which is quite misleading because we have really a stop in 1914. So the genocide is uh, uh, crucial for the publishers we have identified, especially all those from, uh, from Istanbul, they stopped appearing. There's, there's no one copy, uh, let's to say, the only copy from 1914-15, uh, the book we can found, uh, find here is, uh, was published in um, Boston, right? It's not uh, Istanbul, so we do have and, and, and rise in the early 20, uh, in the interwar period, let's say, and most of these publications were published in Aleppo. So, which is also telling, so, and Beirut, Aleppo, so there's a shift from Constantinople uh, uh, to, to Aleppo and, um, and uh, um, Beirut. Uh, so just uh, let me come back to the idea of a project which uh, would deal uh, uh, with the collection in the Mechita uh, congregation. And what the idea behind is uh, actually a multi-perspective approach to cultural heritage and uh, dealing with entangled scripts, languages, and literatures. Um, and if I may, I will briefly describe the project or the idea at least. Uh, with this project, we would like to take up and continue the Viennese tradition of working with our mini Turkish text. So we just started already in 1911. Uh, so after 100 years of existing the Mechitos congregation in Vienna, 
Uh, to the colleagues I have mentioned already, I would like to add my dear colleagues, Benedetta Contin, who is also here at the University of Vienna, and Puna Karakulczyk, who is one of the Andreas Tietze Memorial Fellows here in Vienna. Uh, she is based in Istanbul and Paris, working on linguistics, Armino um, Turkish. Uh, also, uh, my colleague uh, Claudia Römer from our department here, and last but not least, Patricia Engel from the Dan Danube University Krems, which is another university here, uh, who is specialized in research in book and conservation, con um, conservation and uh, restoration. I will just come to these issues uh, in a second. The objectives, uh, if you just to wrap up, what would be the objectives of such a project called Mechita would be uh, using up-to-date material science techniques to ensure the best conservation measures uh, the collection needs, examining the material peculiarities like such as paper, ink, binding in detail, thus helping to study the collection's history more thoroughly and preserve this important heritage for the future. And second, surveying and cataloging systematically the collection, taking into account the results of the material analysis. And third, developing and applying text recognition methods uh, in order to automatically, or let's say semi-automatically transcribe text in Armenian script into Latin script, making available an exceptional corpus for a more nuanced and detailed analysis of the linguistic peculiarities of, let's say, Turkish, Armino Turkish, and ensure new approaches to Ottoman literary and cultural studies. So if you look at the collection, then it's, it is pretty clear that a considerable amount of the collection of the manuscripts and prints are in a pure state of preservation. Uh, be it damaged book bindings, bookworm damages, torn pages, faded ink colors, or hard to read elements due to environmental influence. In order to ensure their survival and usability, natural science technologies will be applied. This will also prepare the ground for, let's say, innovative solutions for sustainable uh, conservation and preservation of the damaged manuscripts. The in-depth analysis of physical and chemical properties of these artifacts will not only provide methods for preservation, but help also to collect important data for answering questions that cannot be solved by historical or philological methods alone. Thus, Mechitra's interdisciplinary combination of natural science on the one hand and humanities will allow, on the other hand, will allow to ask overarching questions. So what is the Sammlungsgeschichte, the collection history of the Armenian Turkish manuscripts? Where were their place of production? Are there any regional variations? What similarities and differences with Ottoman manuscripts in terms of book architecture, formats, materials, uh, et cetera, do we have since? Most of these manuscripts were produced during the 18th and more so in the 19th century. They will be compared with books which were printed during that period. The tools provided by natural science and technology were deployed in order to investigate which mutual influences uh, between manuscript production and book printing there were. Uh, in forms, uh, for example, if you think on the formats, uh, on the material uh, and the script, uh, or the layouting. A preliminary investigation indicates that similar to the Ottoman book printing, uh, uh, so-called, I think what Fetva, Emine, uh, Fet, uh, Emine Fetvaji called printed manuscript culture, uh, which has also be, appears to have existed for the armenian turkish examples. The printing house of the Mechitaris congregation has been deploying, uh, developing a great number of various Armenian typefaces. Uh, Gregoris Kalentia already in 1898 mentions five, 55 different font versions ranging from bread and butter face to ornamented typefaces which were used in printing uh, houses globally. Uh, so I will just mention uh, uh, here uh, about General Archbishop uh, Arsenius Aydin, uh, who was also born in Constantinople. And uh, with under his uh, uh, leadership, let's uh, so to say, 
uh, uh, the Mikitor's congregation has uh, a huge development, especially uh, the printing house. So the printing house was really influential in, in many ways. And uh, the, the, the different font versions I've uh, just mentioned uh, have been also published. Uh, firstly, uh, the uh, already mentioned Kalentia has been dealing with this issue. And uh, in 1910, there was uh, uh, just a publication um, uh, with the fonts uh, what, uh, that were used and produced by the Mechitoris themselves. So I will just show you a few examples. Uh, the really huge variety of Latin scripts and the typos you can see uh, up to the Armenian scripts um, um, and also, uh, um, Demichitors has been publishing and printing uh, huge numbers of uh, books in Russian, uh, in the Serbian script, and of course, uh, at least um, um, Greek script, uh, books in Greek uh, has been also very uh, important, uh, and Demichitors uh, were uh, the leading publishing house in that sense. So, but we do have, also uh, a variety of other scripts which has been published here and work. And you can see the Ottoman ones here on the right side, but you can see that the Mechitras has, uh, uh, the printing has also operating uh, with uh, Japan, Chinese, uh, um, and um, Hebraic, uh, of course, uh, and uh, even uh, runic scripts. So uh, these kind of, uh, uh, font versions has been really used widely worldwide and that was kind of a role model for printing quality and typefaces uh, which has been here um, produced. So given the global impact of the printing conventions of the Mechitoris congregation, the question arises whether and to what extent printing trends influenced the manuscript production, especially during the 18th and 19th century. Um, and therefore, we think that it will be fruitful to investigate in detail the relation between Armenian-Turkish manuscript and book production. Mechita as a project will examine Armenian-Turkish manuscripts uh, in the uh, interface between cultural heritage, science, and humanities. And with this basic research, which is, uh, let's say, in German, we would say Grundlagenforschung, ground research, uh, where I will open, I hope so, and we hope so, new windows for future interdisciplinary studies. It is clear that scripts, as you can see, played a major role, and even so in the Ottoman society, and rather the script than the language was the apparent sign of distinguishing different ethno-religious groups, we must say, but it was also, an element of mutual recognition, as Evangelia Balta pointed out. One of the challenges for students of Turkish studies interested in dealing with Armenian Turkish texts was certainly the Armenian script that may have formed a hurdle. Um, Mechita will help to take this barrier by using transcribers, which is a platform in order to transcribe them into Latin script. I will turn back to this in a minute, just to mention that the hurdle, I was just uh, referring to the script. Uh, there are many, many other hurdles. We may just talk about why Armenian Turkish and uh, works on Armenian Turkish so long has been denied. Um, this uh, all, um, and taking this uh, into consideration and trying to transcribe uh, will enable and, and encourage uh, researchers and students alike hopefully to work and teach with hitherto inaccessible sources. Mechita will provide uh, a comprehensive catalog of Armenian Turkish manuscripts and trying to use um, text encoding initiatives as let, so to say, digital humanities uh, formats and techniques, uh, presenting their codicological and paleographical features, the selection of manuscripts and prints uh, will be digitized and a documentation of conservation and preservation will be prepared, which is, I think, really important that dealing with um, uh, endangered uh, 
texts, manuscripts uh, needs uh, to have been some sort of a standardized ways uh, of uh, dealing uh, with restoration and uh, preparation. Mechita will offer uh, uh, a multi-perspective approach to cultural heritage that stimulates reflection about preconceived positions and allowing to change perspectives, hopefully. It will open new spaces that cross narrow nationalistic cultural heritage bubbles, let's say, and allow fresh ways for cultural heritage discourse. The collection of the Mechita's Congregation of Vienna are best suited for this purpose since I think it offers a fascinating insight into the entangled cultural heritage of Armenians, Ottomans, and Austrians, which goes beyond the common binary of we and the other. The special value of the Armenian Turkish holdings has hardly been adequately appreciated so far and lies in the fact that they enable numerous new research questions and fields, but also new approaches uh, to a more inclusive engagement with cultural heritage. For this, Mechita aims to closely work uh, with also with the Armenian diaspora communities and institutions, of course, with the Mechita's congregation, namely with uh, Professor Archbishop and Professor Levon Zikian, but also with the Hrantin Foundation or the Nuba Library, in, uh, which is based in, uh, that's based in Paris. Mechita, by focusing on Armenian Turkish texts, will provide so we hope, innovative and inclusive research in the fields of Ottoman and Armenian studies and thus hopes to initiate a paradigm shift leaving behind the national literature language approach building uh, on existing important works of colleagues such as Sibuk Aslanian, Evangelia Balta, Murat Cankara, Laura Mignon, Petros Delmatosian, and of course, uh, uh, the already mentioned Johann Strauss. Moreover, by integrating natural science and uh, technologies, we aim to develop new interdisciplinary innovative conservation and preservation techniques, as well as sustainable dissemination solutions. Besides, Mehitar will be an exemplary project that does consider the natural science approach that is, so to say, the material aspects of the texts we are dealing with, as not separated from the humanities approach to the content of these texts we are dealing with. It, in its engagement with the manuscript culture, but an essential method uh, that helps to gain new insights and perspectives dealing with methods such as codicology, paleography, textual criticism, text editing, or cataloging. So just I just mentioned transcubus to Transcribus uh, as a platform for transcribing texts, and I in, uh, will just give you a short um, 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 idea of what I am talking about. I will just show you uh, later some slides. Mechita uh, uh, will, uh, for the first time, develop models to transcribe uh, printed and handwritten Armenian Turkish texts with the Transcribus platform providing access to an extensive corpus and by that enable researchers in Armenian and Ottoman Turkish philology, literary studies, but also from cultural studies to encourage interdisciplinary and transnational research. Further, the Armenian Turkish texts in our manuscript are uh, uh, of great linguistic interest since the Armenian script, be, um, since the Armenian script, because of its flexibility, so to say, and the variety of sounds the 39 letters could represent, tends to reflect their pronunciation more adequately than texts in Ottoman script. Consequently, transcribus will offer new synergies for generating a general, let's say, model for text recognition, and by that provide a new path for working with Ottoman, Armenian, Turkish, texts. This will be of great relevance for the Viennese Turkish studies uh, and hopefully not, not only for us, um, not only because Mechita will build on and deepen its longstanding expertise in codicological uh, and polygraphical expertise of Ottoman manuscripts represented, for instance, by the works of Claudia Ruma and Gisela Proska-Eisler. Furthermore, the Armenian 
our main Turkish sources will be integrated into. So that that is what we think will be changed. Or uh, this is the real paradigm shift. I hope so. So we we're trying to integrate these findings and this kind of approach to these texts into the curriculum of our Turkish studies uh, and and open up uh, Turkish teaching to texts in Armenian Turkish. So um, hopefully we will be able to initiate some sort of Turkish teaching and in, uh, that includes Armenian Turkish uh, texts and that will be taught here at the department. So I've, I've just mentioned uh, Transcubus so sec several times so we'll just uh, skip to that and uh, we'll try um, to show you what uh, what this platform uh, is about. So just to mention that uh, we have already in the end of the 19th century uh, catalogs of published Turkish uh, texts um, in Armenian letters. This is also for, uh, from 1898. Uh, you see uh, the Mechitors have been publishing Armenian Turkish texts. It is about 47 titles. Um, and, uh, but this is not all because um, you have to add all these dictionaries, which the Mechitors were famous for, dictionaries, multilingual dictionaries, uh, which has been published also by the Mechitorists. So uh, already at the end of the 19th century, we do have a, a, a considerable collection of Armenian Turkish uh, texts. So coming to the Armenian script and uh, transcribus, um, uh, Transcubus uh, is like, uh, in the simplest way to tell, is a program that makes use of machine learning and uh, learning algorithms and that allows for training one's own model to transcribe texts, regardless of language and script style. So this is quite interesting. You have a, a program which enables you to read any text in any script as long. And this is so to say the challenge. Um, um, you have to train the system with uh, a considerable amount of texts in order to enable it to learn to read these texts. So for this purpose, a sufficient amount of manually transcribed training data has to be prepared uh, in order to start uh, this training. And we have already initial experiences with using transcribers uh, for transcribing Ottoman Turkish texts and um, so this is the platform you can uh, see. It looks really pretty 90s, I guess, uh, but it's a highly developed uh, platform. Um, and uh, we have already trained um, uh, transcribers with Ottoman manuscripts, handwritten texts, and printed texts. And here I have to mention uh, ISO Action. I ISO is a PhD candidate and she has here in Vienna, she has been working with me since I guess it's uh, already more than one year uh, that we're working with transcribers and training it. And uh, I would say she is the best um, real expert on that issue or, uh, and uh, thanks for that. And we did really, um, she did really a great uh, job uh, and she feeded uh, transcribers uh, with, I will just skip this, um, uh, she feeded transcripts with uh, text um, amounting, I think, uh, around 40,000 words uh, or with Nessig, with the handwritten script type Nessig, in order to train. And what is here important to see is that if you train transcripts, you can get at the moment um, um, a, a character error rate of 15%. That means that this system is able to read 85% of a Nisi handwritten text automatically in the right way. So this is um, for amount of text corpus uh, pretty bad, I would say, because 15% is a high rate. But if you imagine this, um, um, if you had these diplomatics courses and sitting on an Ottoman document, uh, being able to read 85% of the text is pretty uh, success, I would say. So um, this system is learning really incredibly fast. And, and if you go to the printed matter, 
uh, you will see that uh, um, um, Transcruise has um, uh, a much better performance in that sense. So only with 20, I think uh, 15,000 words of printed Ottoman text, we have uh, generated a CR rate of 4.5%. Uh, that means 96% or 95% of the text could be uh, um, read uh, or transcribers can transcribe these texts and uh, uh, this um, and um, does not have a, a big problem. So you see the CR rate here for uh, an Ottoman uh, Turkish uh, printed text and we used Fatmanum Dünahe. That's a relatively late text from the 1920s. But anyway, you see a, a rate of four point thirty three percent. So it's quite promising that we, if we feed up the system with more text, transcribed text, and uh, enable it to train, uh, we will get better results. And I have started in January, uh, I think in January or February, with feeding the system with armeno turkish text. So we started with Kur Oldu, which was um, not by incident, uh, uh, not by uh, accident. It was just because my colleagues, uh, whom I mentioned before, Anisar and Antilia Chili, had a collaborative work on Kur Olu because the text of Kur Olu exists in Ottoman, also in Armenian, and uh, even so in Karamanlik Dika. So we do have the same text in different scripts and different versions, apparently. Uh, they were published in different uh, uh, publishing houses, different years. Anyway, it's the same text. So that give, uh, or gave us the possibility to, to look at uh, in more detail uh, how Ottoman Turkish works in different scripts. So uh, here you see the Karaman Dika, and I will just mention uh, um, Edith Ambrose, who has also worked. Uh, Edith Ambrose is here, also in Vienna, has worked on the Karaman Dika version. So we started with this publication, and then uh, soon we changed to Aknes, uh, another Turkish text in Armenian script. And the results um, by feeding transcribers with around 25,000 words uh, were really uh, surprisingly good. So we had a CR rate below 2%. So that means if you look at the results, so we had a test and the red ones are the mistakes here. And that means that um, you see 1.66%, that means uh, almost 98, 99% uh, of accuracy. So Armenian texts um, in Armen Turkish texts in Armenian script uh, is uh, not a problem at all for transcribers, it seems. So it's quite um, um, understandable if you look at the ligatures of the Ottoman text and the handwritten ones. So Armenian is really um, a very um, simple uh, version, let's say, for, for, uh, uh, for the um, transcribal system. Anyway, it needs much more text in order to get a model which is able to uh, read any text we can just upload and uh, um, and um, push the button, let's say. Um, so the possible outcomes of such an approach would be at a linguistic level, uh, we can uh, have um, presented the walls uh, much better. Uh, we do have uh, different uh, styles of vernacular phonetics. We do have, uh, let's say, uh, on a cultural level, heritage level, as I mentioned, a more interwined uh, perspective. Um, and we do have, at least for those who are interested in literary history, a more inclusive approach to literary history of the Ottoman period. The challenges are clear. We do need, and at the moment, we do not have enough transcription texts, which means we are sitting and transcribing texts, uh, basically, in order to have uh, material for the training. And of course, as it is for the Ottoman uh, texts, uh, it is so for the Armenian Turkish texts, uh, we do have different periods, different genres, and that, uh, and uh, uh, even 
uh, hybrid and mixed up texts, which make the reading, of course, more difficult than it sounds when I'm telling here of the success story of transcribers. But anyway, it has a high potential in order to get really uh, quick uh, results in order to get access to these kind of texts. That said, I would say uh, probably, uh, hopefully we'll have, uh, we will have a discussion and I would like to have uh, inputs and ideas of what you think about this uh, uh, project idea. And um, thank you for listening and um, I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>